They say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and for the past decade, Disney's been trying their very best to single-handedly prove that idiom wrong. Do I need to say any more? I know why you're here. You know why you're here. They've done it again, boys. Another remake abomination of one of their classic films for us to laugh at. And weirdly enough, for once, audiences and professional critics can both agree that it's terrible. Like, no doubt the hate for Disney live-action remakes has been growing gradually over time. The more they make, the more people get fed up. Started with Alice in Wonderland, the one no one counts. Then Cinderella, the one we all forgot existed. Then Jungle Book, the one people actually enjoyed. Then Beauty and the Beast, the one that was pretty much the same, but they auto-tuned Emma Watson and they pretended LeFou was openly gay. Aladdin, the one where they tried to replace Robin Williams with Oscar Slap Man and everyone made memes. Dumbo, the one where they tried something different and got mediocre results so no one cared. Lion King, the one everyone but I went to see. Lady and the Tramp, did this one even happen? Mulan, the one I made a video about where they filmed outside Chinese concentration camps. And now their newest bastardization, Pinocchio. Ten films in twelve years, and that's not even counting Cruella, Maleficent and its sequel, the Alice in Wonderland sequel, Christopher Robin, Pete's Dragon. Do you think that's enough goddamn films? Nostalgia can only take you so far before the rose tinted glasses fade. I'm just surprised it took this long for people to finally catch on. Remember when Disney was pumping out new Star Wars films left and right every couple months? They had so many pointless spin-off movies planned for the most minuscule, inconsequential stuff in the Star Wars universe, but we shut that shit down in three years after Solo bombed hard, so why is it taking us so much longer to realize these things are no good? Oh, but hold up, what's that? Oh, it's just my phone reminding me I need to play Raid Shadow Legends. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Do you like playing on your console but hate its lack of portability? Well, Raid's got graphics that rival those games in spades, not to mention hundreds of champions to develop and build a team with for whatever you're in the mood for, whether it's purely casual or super in-depth. Sure, Raid could have stopped after becoming such a massive player in the mobile and PC market, but they've only kept adding over the past three years. Whether it's the Doom Tower, a 120-level challenge with new, unique bosses to keep old players on their toes, or the multi Headed Hydra, one of the toughest bosses they've made in a while, with each head having a different ability, there's no end in sight to the content they're brewing up. Just this month, they've released a whole new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress, and if you can take it down, well, you get access to another new feature, Awakening, allowing you to transform how your champions perform in battle, and damn, it looks pretty slick. Not enough to convince you? Well, if you play for seven days between now and October 27th, you'll get access to their new legendary version of an old favorite Death Knight. Just look at him, just, just look. Still not enough? If you want to level him up to level 50 instantly, just use the promo code D. DK rises for that, plus a ton of free stuff. Still not enough? You're pretty hard to sell, but I respect it. If you're still wondering whether you should get Raid, you can check out my link in the description or the QR code on screen and get the new Champ Virgis, 200k Silver, an Energy Refill, an Ancient Shard, and an XP Boost. For all you nerds out there, that's $30 of loot. You're basically throwing money away not to take it. All this treasure will be waiting for you right here. So go on out there and play your new favorite mobile app. Thanks again to Raid for sponsoring. Hope to see you in the game. And back to the video. It could be because, as opposed to Star Wars, the Disney animation catalog has been around for significantly longer and greater variation, so people were willing to put up with more for a longer time thinking it could get better, which would logically make sense. Or maybe the film is just that bad, but come on, how hard is it to make a decent Pinocchio movie based on the 1940 Disney film? Wooden Boy gets brought to life by a fairy, he's told he has to figure out right from wrong with the help of a talking cricket acting as his conscience, he unwittingly gets himself in situation after situation, lies about it, then figures out he shouldn't, saves his father, becomes real, boom, bestseller, makes the modern day equivalent of $825 million domestically. Who hasn't heard the story? And yet the film was supposedly so bad, even the ever-looming fear of Disney keeping critics from watching advanced screenings for their biggest film of the year wasn't enough to stop the bad reviews from rolling in. That's a real thing they've been open about doing for years, by the way, in case you didn't know. But yeah, if that can't stop them, you know it's gotta be a real piece of work. When Rotten Tomatoes, the Disney cocksucking kings, the Last Jedi is a 91% out of 100 guys say Disney has a bad product, all bets are off. So what even is this film, and how to get such a bad reputation in as short of time as it has? Well, part of the animosity towards this particular remake could come from the fact it's clearly attempting to upstage another Pinocchio film that's been in production for way longer, Guillermo del Toro's stop-motion iteration coming to Netflix this December. It's a film that's been in production hell for over a decade now, getting new directors, losing directors, being cancelled, getting picked up by Netflix, but finally it is coming out. And there's a ton of hype around it. The visuals look amazing, it's intended to be more adult-focused, something that's nearly unheard of in stop-motion features 
feature films, considering how rare they already are. The project's apparently going to have a greater political focus, being set during the time of Benito Mussolini and the National Fascist Party of Italy. It's got plenty to be interested in or excited for, but you know how Disney is, they can never be upstaged. Doesn't matter if they weren't thinking about making a remake before Del Toro was already decently into production, they're doing it now! And would you look at that, the first video that shows up when you type in Pinocchio 2022 trailer on YouTube or Pinocchio 2022 on Google is the Disney version! What a coincidence! Just like the film coincidentally happens to be one of the lowest effort regurgitation Disney remakes of them all while still missing the entire point of the original film and making everything worse! I fucking hate it, thanks! But no! Disney would never do that. They're a wholesome, non-petty, incredibly trustworthy brand, as can be seen from the other videos I've made talking about them in the past. It would just be so uncharacteristic of them. But who knows? You never know what to expect from Robert Zemeckis. To be honest, after he was announced as the film's director, I did become slightly more interested in the project because of his involvement alone. The guy has a varied history with film and animation, having created that creepy motion capture trend in the mid to late 2000s, but also Roger Rabbit's. And while his most recent films have consisted almost entirely of box office bombs, they were at least interesting bombs. I wouldn't go as far as to say they were good, but they were his, so maybe he could sprinkle some of that experimentation on an otherwise soulless assembly line product, and if it didn't work out, he'd probably still make something enjoyable for completely unrelated reasons. This is the guy that brought us Marcy's mom, after all, so if Disney's gonna make a film everyone wants to fail, there's no one more experienced for the job. Really, I was hoping for a funny disaster, and did I get it? Eh. Kinda. It's debatable whether it's a new low for Disney when the Lion King remake exists, but it is a complicated beast of a production, and a lot of that stems from its failed attempt at repetition. And a lot of that stems from its failed attempt at repetition. And a lot of that stems from its- Call me an old man if you like, though that would be weird since I'm 18, but I can think back to a time when Disney used to be more experimental with their remakes, you know, actually given a justification for them to exist. Specifically, Alice and Jungle Book were both remakes for sure, having the same characters, world, and general outline for a story, but they tried new things as well as old and made for decent experiences, but then it all changed when the second Alice film that went in an even more outlandish direction bombed, and Beauty and the Beast made $1.2 billion at the box office. Now every direct remake of theirs is either too samey without any of the charm like Lion King, Aladdin, and Beast, or attendedly so different that it falls flat like Mulan or Dumbo. That middle ground that works so well for them is almost non-existent nowadays, so that leads to the question, where does Pinocchio lie? I'm not entirely sure, and I think I know why that's the case. Like I said, Robert Zemeckis makes weird shit, and that includes remakes or adaptations like Polar Express and Christmas Carol. So he's dabbled in that kind of media before, and he probably has a ton of batshit crazy ideas for ways to take a remake of Pinocchio. He sends his draft into Disney thinking it'll go smoothly, and they send it back with a ton of notes. Can't deviate from the main story, can't do this and this and this and that, and Zemeckis finally realizes he's working on a live-action film at Disney, something so heavily controlled and focus tested, whether it's remakes, Star Wars, or the MCU, that having a director is pretty much a formality. After that, he says fuck this, copies the original film script, then he adds in all the ideas that Disney didn't say no to without any cohesion or purpose and calls it a day. Basically, he wanted to make a remake like Dumbo, and Disney wanted him to do Lion King, so he salvaged whatever he could, whether it worked or not, and then for the rest, he changed nothing. And when I say that, I mean nothing. I didn't keep count of how often it happened, it was just so numerous, but if you've seen both films, you'll immediately recognize that several lines of dialogue are directly lifted without change from the original film, word for word, and unlike other remakes I've watched through for review, instead of watching one than the other like normal, I decided that, considering what I was up against, it'd make more sense for me to watch the two simultaneously, stopping when one finished a scene and seeing how it plays out in the other, and goddamn, this method helps so considerably for me to see just how much was truly recycled. I'm not just talking about all the wink wink nudge nudge we said that line shit either. I'm talking about lines that would otherwise be inconsequential if they were changed even slightly. Like what is this, a high schooler's research paper? It's full of plagiarism. Disney, you don't get to do that sneaky shit without people noticing. This isn't fucking Shakespeare, it's not impressive when your remakes haphazardly regurgitate unaltered, unimportant dialogue as if it were that iconic. This ain't Romeo plus Juliet, and it's not the repetition alone that bothers me. Sure, that's lazy and lacking in creativity on its own, but maybe I wouldn't have as much of a problem with it if, from the few rewrites that were made, it didn't mean these unaltered lines and moments contradicted what was happening on screen. For instance, in the original film and the remake, one of the first temptations Pinocchio faces comes from a fox named Honest John, who wants to sell Pinocchio to a puppet master and make some money, claiming he'll become a famous actor, and so he doesn't have to go to school. Jiminy Cricket, Pinocchio's appointed conscience, reminds him that they had a talk regarding temptation earlier in the film, and that's what Honest John is. But wait a second, in the remake, Jiminy doesn't say shit about temptation before this moment. In the original he does, right before 
before singing Give a Little Whistle, which was also cut from the remake, but it's not there. Don't let the film gaslight you. I triple checked. So saying that exact same line of remember that talk we had about temptation is complete nonsense to anyone that was paying attention when that scene didn't happen and hasn't seen the original. Later on, after Pinocchio's gone to Pleasure Island and given in to all his desires with other hoodlums, he sees the closest friend he's made, the Lampwick, start turning into a donkey, and in the original, he first thinks it's the cigar he's smoking, then he thinks it's the beer he's drinking. Classic gag. One problem with the remake, they don't smoke or drink beer. They have root beer. Cause a kid smoking and drinking in a fictional story where they explicitly say it's bad? How could they ever get away with that? Except in 1940, when the original came out. And you want to know the kicker? Pinocchio barely even drinks the root beer, an already non-alcoholic drink, whereas in the original, he's hammered as shit. The joke doesn't work. There's no way of salvaging it at this point. You should just give up. And speaking of the kids turning into donkeys, Pinocchio becoming one in the first place doesn't work here. But to explain that, I need to discuss how fundamentally the remake screwed up the basic point of everything the original was trying to do. Earlier, I briefly mentioned Jiminy Cricket and his role as Pinocchio's figurative conscience, telling him what he should and shouldn't do. But if you've seen the animated film, did you ever notice that the relationship between Jiminy and Pinocchio mirrors how he chooses to act? When Pinocchio gets redirected to the theater by Honest John, Jiminy sleeps in, similar to how Pinocchio isn't thinking about how becoming an actor wouldn't make him a real boy. When he haphazardly joins the puppets, Jiminy stays away, thinking Pinocchio doesn't need a conscience, but after he gets locked up in a cage, Pinocchio calls out for Jiminy, needing a conscience to make sense of the bad decision he's made. Finally, after Pinocchio's been corrupted by Pleasure Island, Jiminy gives up on Pinocchio, as he doesn't respect his conscience if it means he can't act on his desires. It all links up. And honestly, I didn't think it would be necessary for me to explain that. It all seems pretty self-evident if you follow along with the story and themes. But I guess old Robert Zemeckis in his old age might be losing some of those key senses, because he royally fucked up that whole dynamic. Throughout the majority of the film, Pinocchio and Jiminy are completely separated. First, he sleeps in like in the original, but then he fetches a ride from a talking bird that takes up more time. Then for like 20 minutes, he's just stuck under a jar. Then after helping Pinocchio out of the cage, he's gone for another 10 minutes. None of it's synced up with Pinocchio acting badly or misbehaving. They're pretty much separate entities in this version of the film rather than having an explicit connection. Plus, Jiminy's whole existence in the film feels arbitrary instead of essential since Pinocchio already seems to know the difference between right and wrong. Originally, all the actions made might have been led by John or other characters, but it was Pinocchio who decided to indulge them when he could have walked away and was warned. The decisions were clearly his own made from temptation, and the film's plot was about him figuring out how not to do that. In the remake, the approach isn't even close to the same. Here, Pinocchio is able to avoid John's temptation and goes to school, something that didn't happen before, but for whatever reason, he gets kicked out! Why? I don't understand! He did as he was instructed to and listened to his conscience, but it didn't work out? Isn't that antithetical to what the movie is trying to teach? And what exactly was he supposed to do after that, go in again? The movie presents it like Pinocchio had other options besides going with Honest John, but what else is there? If I was Pinocchio, still new to the world, learning everything, and I was presented with the opportunity at some kind of stardom, but then I go with my conscience and that fails, why would I listen to my conscience again? What would my conscience even be able to come up with for a new solution? Not that Pinocchio almost ever gets to hear from his conscience in the first place. The same thing happens on Pleasure Island. In the animated film, John convinces him to go. And doubly, this is Pinocchio's own stupid decision made from temptation, as by now, he should have known better than to listen to John, but he goes anyway, and he smokes, breaks shit, drinks, everything, and that makes a jackass out of him and the kids. Wanna guess how it goes in the remake? After Pinocchio escapes the puppet master, he's on his way home, then zoop! He's snatched up and put on the wagon to Pleasure Island. Doesn't even get to decide for himself whether he'll go or not. There's a new bad, forgettable song about peer pressure making him go, but he's definitely still not thrilled about it, and when he gets there, he's repulsed by all the misbehaving he sees. It's almost like he has a fully formed conscience and knows he shouldn't do things, therefore he doesn't, but if he already had a conscience without Jiminy or anyone else needing to explain it to him, what's the point of Pinocchio trying to prove that to become a real boy when he already fits the criteria? And why does he still become a donkey when he doesn't do anything? Sure, he's along for the ride, but the whole point of Pleasure Island is that after the kids do all their shit, they make jackasses of themselves, literally. But Pinocchio didn't make a jackass of himself in this, so why does he turn into one? Zemeckis, why would you write it so Pinocchio doesn't do any of the bad shit he needs to in order to learn and become better, yet he still faces the consequences as if he did them. I guess it could have been done to make Pinocchio more easily likable, as if the original wasn't likable because he had flaws and the movie was about him ironing those out. But to reiterate, the whole point is that he's got a ton of flaws as a newly living person that doesn't know right from wrong or how bad temptation is. If you take that away, there's no journey, and the film's whole purpose for existing has been removed. Which reminds me, the ending. So how do you mess up the ending of Pinocchio? It's so simple. Pinocchio saves Geppetto from the whale monster at the cost of himself, and the blue fairy rewards Pinocchio Pinocchio's bravery and selflessness by keeping her into the bargain and turning him into a real boy. Nice, simple, logical, good. In the remake, Pinocchio does the same 
same thing of saving everyone, though this time he acts as a motorboat and Monstro is turned into an actual monster for no discernible reason, but putting that aside, Pinocchio doesn't end up being the one that's hurt but Geppetto, and you're not gonna be ready for what happens next. Pinocchio cries while singing When You Wish Upon a Star, and the tears bring him back to life. Hold on a second, this... I've seen this before. No, not, not in every terrible piece of media ever, it was... That's it! This same scene happened in Pinocchio A True Story, the Russian one where Pinocchio's super gay and voiced by Polly Shore. Oh god. Did Disney's live-action Pinocchio 2022 film unwittingly rip off another cheaper knockoff? I mean, it came out first by a country mile. <laughs> Holy shit, that's great! How could you- How could- Wow, I'm impressed by how pathetic that is. Writing the same ending as a film that's biggest actor was Polly Shore, how could it get any funnier than that? <laughs> That's how it ends? We don't know whether or not he becomes a real boy? What the fuck, Robert, Rob, buddy? This isn't some philosophical you decide the ending ass story. The whole point of Pinocchio is about him becoming real by knowing what it is to act like a real person and not a little shit. In this version still, the fairy says he can choose to become a real boy if he proves himself, and though that's superfluous with how good he is from the start of the remake, he still goes through the same general line of events as before, so leaving it ambiguous opens the audience up to the idea that A, he didn't prove himself, B, he didn't want to be a real boy which is fucking stupid and untrue, or C, the fairy lied. None of these are good options, and it certainly doesn't fill you with a feeling of wonder and astonishment. Is this the setup for a sequel? Like that shit they're doing for the Lion King remake? What new shit would there even be to add? Not like the crew behind this could make anything both original and interesting when you take into account the few new things they added that only make the film more disorganized. The way I view new additions to a remake is this. If one trait's going to be added and you want the runtime to be comparable to the original, unless you're a super talented writer, it'd probably probably be best to, in return, remove something to balance it out. Maybe get rid of one character you believe was boring and replace him with someone better suited for the version of the story you're trying to tell. The same thought process applies to character trades, world building, and so on. But Disney's never smart enough to do that and they just add, add, add new elements, not taking into account how they might take away from the main story or derail a narrative. In the remake of Mulan, she has a sister that does nothing but start conflicts and gets married off at the end, the thing Mulan stood against but is now okay with for some reason. In the Aladdin one, Jasmine's got a friend that the genie hits on, cause if anyone needed a love interest in Aladdin, it was genie. So what new garbage did this one decide to endlessly shove down our gullets? Well, starting with the characters that were there from the beginning, seeing as Jimmy Cricket started the original in a less than presentable state, that barely spoken and basically entirely visual character trait is amplified and turned into a full conflict of his, trying to shake his bummish ways and become responsible enough to be Pinocchio's conscience. Honestly, it wouldn't be the worst idea if it was done with most any other character, but again, Jiminy Cricket is meant to serve as a figurative representation in line with Pinocchio's conscience. Notice how in the animated film, other than trying to be there for and lead Pinocchio in the right direction, he didn't have a major character arc of his own. That's intentional. Jiminy's not the one with problems, he's the one helping Pinocchio when he's willing to listen. But hey, why am I still talking about this? I've already discussed it more than the movie did. They dropped that shit almost immediately so we can focus on another new character trait. Now tell me if you've heard this one before. Geppetto, Pinocchio's father, now creates clocks so that he can remember his dead wife and child. Why did his wife like clocks? I don't know. What significance did they have to him and his wife? I don't know. What were his wife and son like? I don't know. How'd they die? I don't fucking know! Why does Geppetto have a shop explicitly for clocks when he doesn't sell any of them? complicated. But damn, if they don't give the most blatant, unapologetically forced, terribly delivered exposition dialogue about how much the clocks mean to him you've ever heard. They are beyond price, senora. I'm very sorry, but I cannot tell you any of my Google clocks. My clocks, they mean everything to me. Clocks are my most special creations. He sure wants us to believe these clocks are important to him. I wonder why. Could it be for the inevitable scene where Pinocchio comes back to find all Geppetto's clocks are gone, then he's told that Geppetto sold them all for a boat in search of Pinocchio? Dang, that's so sad. His wife loved clocks. And other things. I assume. Wait, no, 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 no th th that's not it. The real explanation behind why Geppetto has so many clocks is for the patented Disney Cox Suckathon. Just look at all those clocks for properties that won't be depicted in media until decades after when this is set. Okay, that's sort of a low blow. We're kind of supposed to believe these things could exist anyway without Disney, and I can get that for like Maleficent and Snow White, but I still want to call bullshit. Woody, as he's depicted in the clock here, is directly connected to the idolized image of cowboys created by Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, which didn't come to Europe 
Europe at all until 1888, whereas The Adventures of Pinocchio, the book this and the animated film are based on, came out and was set in 1883. They went so hard for the product placement they didn't realize this wouldn't work from a historical perspective. So take that movie about a wooden boy coming to life and journeying the Italian countryside with a cricket in a dress suit. But jokes aside, we all know that is exactly why the clocks were there other than for a cheap emotional moment. Otherwise, they would have fleshed out literally anything else about them and their connection to Geppetto. But maybe Geppetto just hasn't told us the fact that his wife loved clocks enough times. Can he say it again? I made them for my beloved Costanza. And again? And she loved every one of them. And again? Every one of them. This is now a defining characteristic of Geppetto's character. He repeats fucking everything. I can't tell for sure if it was intended in the script or if Tom Hanks thought it would make the performance more believable, but I do see the slow deterioration of a man who's clearly been overcome with Alzheimer's and has to say the same sentence over and over again until he knows he said it. And one who completely forgets his own accent after long enough. Pinocchio! Well, of course he can run on water. He's made of wood. You did all that in one day? I mean, think of all the other new characters that time could have been spent on. All two of them. First up, Talking Seagull Comic Relief. She does almost nothing in the film but make quips until the third act where she... What the fuck am I looking at right now? Second character, some girl working for the Puppet Master Circus that wants to dance like a ballerina, but can't because she has a broken... disabled leg? The film's never too clear about whether it's a permanent injury or not, but either way, we need to feel super sad for her as she sings a song about... This isn't a bit, I can't remember a single bar she sang. Um, I'm gonna go watch it again. Oh, I just got the point of her character. I completely forgot while I was writing the script for this because it's just that unimportant. So she's got a leg injury, and that means she can't dance, so she uses the puppet to do it. The end. That's, um, that's her whole character. We're introduced to her as being that, she sings about that being what she is, and then we move on. She's got no personality or screen presence, ultimately does nothing for the plot, and the only other scene involving her comes in the third act where she asks Pinocchio if he wants to join the circus now that they've locked up the abusive puppet master in a family guy cutaway. Last night, the carabinieri arrested Stromboli and put him in jail! <laughs> wow! And he says nah, but it's... It's super heartfelt, because the character meant so much to Pinocchio. <laughs> What was her name again? Eh, it's not important. And Bob Chapik himself probably said the same thing to the VFX team after they asked him, How do you want the movie to look? Another reason I was looking forward to seeing a Zemeckis-directed Pinocchio film was the potential for crazy, uncanny valley-ish effects. Unironically, Zemeckis has made major strides in motion capture and other integratory forms of animation, but goddamn, if it isn't funny to watch the in-between process while he figures it out. And instead of explaining further, I'll spend five uninterrupted seconds showing this image of a Martian baby from Mars Needs Moms. Unfortunately, we don't get anything so horrific in Pinocchio, but God, does it look cheap. And as the main attraction, no one stands out more than the puppet boy himself. I knew from the beginning that even when Pinocchio was a puppet and not alive, the crew would use full CG instead of an actual marionette, and to an extent, I understand. The CG version of Pinocchio does not look or move like a wooden figure at all, so if they had people actually using the things before transitioning to him, it'd be too uncanny. Then again, a lot of professional productions make it easier to hide the transition by placing partial CG on the real model. That's what they did for scary stories to to tell in the Dark, a Del Toro production, funnily enough, that had a fifth of Pinocchio's budget and it looks godly, so who's to say the same effect couldn't have been done for Pinocchio? Hell, it most likely would have been cheaper and easier on the VFX team, so they could focus more on making parts of the production look better. But that requires more work on Disney's part, and they'd much prefer to have as little work to do on their part as possible, so tough shit, Pinocchio looks like he's made of plastic now, and whenever characters hold him, you can feel the air the actors are grasping without a reference point. It's like I'm right back in the cinema- Did I say cin- why did I put cinema in my fucking- script, am I British or something? It's like I'm right back in the movie theater watching Transformers Age of Extinction. He just... He never looks like he's in the shot at any point, and it's painstakingly obvious. The design they chose doesn't look like it would be functional in the real world at all, and while you can get away with that in a cartoon, it's a bit more difficult when you want to pretend it's actually there. But no character gets it worse in the remake than Figaro the Cat and Cleo the Fish. They're so expressive and full of personality in the original. Ultimately, they aren't all that important, but as far as comic release go, they're not so in-your-face or annoying or so insignificant you wonder why they were there. And that means the animators have two options for live action, Lion King 2019 or something that isn't complete garbage. And I'll give credits. They try to add a pinch more to the pet's designs, but it's nowhere near enough. They're still more dead-eyed than if they'd gotten actual cats and fish to play them. Thankfully, they aren't around as much for me to feel unfathomable rage at, but that didn't stop the crew from putting in needless effects wherever they thought possible. While doing research into the production of the film, I saw a couple film critics label it a good-looking movie, or at the least better than other live-action Disney films before, so I want to ask, 
Did I watch a different movie? Is this like the incident with the Fallout 76 Collector's Edition where they sent out canvas bags to influencers, but then for the general public they sent out shit made from nylon? Cause that's what it feels like. Compared to other Disney remakes, this shit looks cheap as hell, and weirdly, they put a ton of focus on it. The scene of Pinocchio dancing with other puppets is extended, the shadowy guys that are shown in the Pleasure Island scene for like a second are turned into actual shadow people that the ringleader rides like he's on horseback, the Pleasure Island scene itself is extended when there was no need to and doesn't add anything all that more interesting, they turn Monstro from a whale into a stupid looking monster with tentacles and an evil laugh. <laughs> Jiminy has been transformed from a jolly talking cricket to a green Rey Mysterio Jr. I'm assuming because the designers thought his cheeks were some kind of shell. And the fairy? Dear God, the fairy. Why has Disney adopted this stupid half-faded Thor love and thunder ass effect for human characters displayed in a mythical fashion? It's so hilariously bad. 2012's Colin, they say that you can keep your shitty effect, they don't want it. It never ceases to amaze me how easily a company can burn up money on a product when they don't have any predetermined intent or vision behind it other than get it done by the deadline. Remember the original Iron Man? That movie came out in 2008 on a budget of 140 mil, slightly less than Pinocchio, but probably around the same after inflation. And it still looks great today! That was before Disney overworked VFX studios to the point they dreaded getting work from them. That was when artistic vision mattered. That was when not every single moment of action was heavily coated in pure CG. This? is soulless, no matter how many times it tries to pull at your heartstrings. You can't pull on them if your fingers aren't fucking real. And there's a perfect example for me to show you what I mean. Believe it or not, this isn't the only live-action Pinocchio movie to come out in recent years. Back in 2019, Italians, the people that originally created the story of Pinocchio, made a film adaptation of the original story. And that film is amazing! They use practical effects as often as possible, and it shows. Everything moves so naturally, feels so full, looks so elegant and consistent, and... Well, there. Just look at Pinocchio. You think that look was attained in Photoshop? No, it's almost entirely prosthetic. This is a film that uses CGI as it was meant to be used. Not as a crutch that would leave a film as pure green screen if it were removed, but a helpful hand in the moments where you couldn't physically pull off certain effects. That includes other puppet characters. Most of them are dwarves in makeup, and ah, oh, it looks so good. Good! It got nominated for Oscars for looking so phenomenal. A foreign film getting nominated for multiple different Oscars outside of foreign film. Aside from Parasite, that pretty much never happens, but it's well deserved. And all on a budget of 13 million dollars. Not 130 million. 13 million. One eleven and a half of Disney remake Pinocchio's budget. Ain't that a slap to the face for Disney. And if you want to watch a live action Pinocchio film that gives a unique version of the story with interesting visuals in a more refined manner, the 2019 version is free on Amazon with English dub and subtitles. There's no reason to waste your time with the Disney remake. You may have picked up on how, throughout this entire video, I've never referred to the remake as Pinocchio 2022, and that's because it doesn't deserve that kind of grand, all-encompassing title as if it's the definitive version. I'd give that title to Pinocchio a true story before I gave it to this. In the end, it's a distraction. Nothing more, nothing less. There's no vision to be had, no story to be told, no reimagined ideas to be used. Really, the only reason I'm making a video about it, besides clowning on another Disney remake failure, is to tell you to watch the Del Toro film because every god knows a positive video is never going to top a negative one. I'll still make a video discussing the new film when it comes out, don't you have any suspicions about that? But for now, in the words of the prophet Robert Van Winkle, aka Vanilla Ice, I'll just say, lose the zero, get with the hero, and watch Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, in select theaters November 2022, on Netflix December 9th, 2022. Mark your calendars and give the Disney remake a skip. I've been Just Stop, and I'll see ya.